Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to today's SNAP AR live stream session. My name is Elena Nizhnik, and today we'll be talking about how you can improve the performance and make a more richer experiences for your Snapchat lenses using LensCloud. Today, we have a really special guest who you may actually have already seen before on Snap AR's channel or during technical sessions, and I will let Olha introduce herself a little bit later. But before we get started, let's just remind uh, let's just talk about the fact that this session is dedicated to our participants of the Lensathon. And if you're not already participating, there is still 19 days left because the submissions are due on this, uh, on January 31st. I'm talking about December 31st. That's previous months of previous year. So if you have not already signed up, we'll drop a link here in description for you. And if you're participating, please let us know in description. Uh, we're looking forward to see what experiences you will create. There are so many different categories uh, this time in the Lensathon. $200,000 in real cash prizes to be won. So we're really looking forward to seeing what you will do. And we're wishing you all best of luck if you're participating. Olha, welcome to the stream. Please let us know about yourself and what you will show us today. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Olha, AR engineer in Snapchat. Um, some of you may uh, probably met me before or seen some of my videos. And today we're going to cover a new feature, a part of the Lens Cloud services, services at bar Snapchat, such as remote assets. We're gonna talk, what is remote asset? Why are they good for your lenses? We're gonna walk through organizations and permissions, learn some best practices, supported asset types, and um, utilize some useful asset library resources to actually prototype a lens using those features. Um, so what is remote asset? Remote asset is an asset, we can think about 3D model, the texture, the audio, the video, that is actually is not bundled into your lens, um, but is downloaded on demand in certain time, um, a certain point of time when lens is already running. Uh, why do we need that? Um, so first, um, just to squeeze out, uh, squeeze out more uh, out of your lens, put in more content, which is particularly important which, with, when more of the try-on experiences are coming in and in lens purchases. Um, also to increase engagement. Uh, if there is a lens that is loaded instantly, it's so much more engaging than the lens that takes like a couple seconds to load. And um, uh, also, uh, the total of 25 additional megabytes of space is available uh, for you uh, via remote asset per lens and up to 10 megabytes per, um, per asset. Also, um, so since Lens Cloud, um, so this is a feature a part of Lens Cloud, it's powered by the same infrastructure and you can use same organization um, structure to manage your asset and organization can use up to 500 megabytes of remote asset storage. Uh, so to sum up, uh, so there are like a little outline. So each asset uh, can be uploaded to one organization where multiple users can use assets from that organization, uh, but um, your project can only use assets uh, from only one organization. Uh, on another note, uh, you can use your remote assets across lenses, and since they are being cached, this could also improve the performance across different lenses all at once. And um, so just a couple links uh, that Elena will be sending you over, uh, just like a general lens cloud overview, remote assets guide, the video guide we made previously was so really cute with those really cute uh, assets and um, some like our use case specific guide, which is an important video texture uh, to Lens Studio, which has some uh, little details to it. Uh, and this is something that we are going to be building today. Um, I do feel like a lot of you are young people. Maybe you're not remembering those old retro TVs. And uh, so, but this is something that uh, gives me comfort, reminds me of my childhood. So this is something we're going to build. And um, I think this use case um, kind of covers um, basically all the uh, 
everything that uh, remote asset storage allows us to um, leverage. Uh, there are a couple of resources uh, that I'm going to be grabbing along the way. Uh, you can find them on Lens Studio Asset Library, and uh, we'll get into those uh, later along the way. And uh, yes, please feel free to ask questions in chat at any time. Elena will, um, will announce those to me, and I'll try to answer as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, let's actually switch to Lens Studio and um, try to set up the lens with remote assets. Um, so I'm starting with almost empty project. Um, I just kind of created a preset with certain resources already imported. Those resources are not remote yet. Uh, just a couple um, audio files a couple textures and a couple prefabs so I can actually show you how remote assets work. Um, so remote assets, uh, in order to use remote assets, you have to be logged into my lenses account. Uh, so please do that. And remote assets panel can be found here at the bottom of the resources panel with a little cloud on it. And just to, to uh, double check, I'm using Lens Studio uh, 3.34 um, or later. Uh, so, as this panel is opened, when you open it for the first time, you'll be prompted to create an organization and a folder for your assets. I'm not going to cover that right now uh, because I already have it set up. But if you uh, visit our uh, guide page and go through the video, it would show you how to set everything properly. So, let's go and upload um, our first remote asset. This could be done in a couple different ways. Uh, it, you can do that directly uh, by right clicking on the supported asset types, which I'm going to go through uh, in a minute, and select upload to remote assets. What I just did. Um, so since this file is pretty small, it was uploaded almost instantly. And as soon as I did that, the another file has popped up in my resources panel, which is actually a reference to the resource, which I will be using to, which API I'm going to be using in order to grab the actual asset as I'm running my lens. And there is a, a, a in case if you're uploading multiple assets, you can also use this button and menu and uh, for example, select um, three textures all at once or I can also um, upload a prefab. So I did upload several different types of assets uh, in order to show you how they work. So at this point of time, we do support a direct upload of the next asset types, such as audio files, uh, such as um, pictures, and such as object prefabs. But uh, we do actually have a lot more flexibility here. And this is something that I'm going to be actually showcasing today. We can upload like a, lo a large object hierarchies that already include references to other resource types and um, component setups uh, via uploading the prefab uh, object to the, um, to the remote asset storage. So, um, at this moment, I do have uh, those references to remote assets. And um, what do I actually do with them? How do I use them in my lens? So the first natural thing you would do is, for example, if those assets are created by someone else in your organization, you actually want to double check what is in there. And in order to do that, um, I created like a little um, debug tool, which is called Preview Remote Asset. Uh, which allows you to pick inside what is there. So this is not actually a, a script that we're going to be using. Uh, this is just um, just a little debug view. Uh, so once again, where I found it, I pressed on the asset library button at the top panel. I uh, switched to the tool category over here, and uh, I selected the preview remote asset. You can also use a uh, search bar for that, which will uh, filter this out. Um, let's close this panel for now. Um, 
and uh, I'm just going to, since we're going to be building like the uh, back camera experience, I'm going to switch uh, to a different preview so everything is uh, better visible. And I will also add a device uh, tracking component. Uh, we're going to need it later anyways, and also it will help uh, the preview remote asset to uh, work properly. Uh, so I drag the preview remote asset, place the objects panel, prefab into my objects panel and selected this uh, script on it, which is called preview remote asset as well. Um, there is a readme provided along with this script that you can always refer to uh, if you, in case you forgot something. And the only thing we can do and the only customizable field over here is a reference asset input. And um, I'm going to uh, plug in um, the resource references that were imported to my project one by one. And as soon as I do it, I actually see my texture imported. Um, so I just tried that and another texture. And uh, when I plug in the music, I actually hear music. I'm not sure you hear that too, um, just details of implementation. And if I plug in the uh, prefab, um, so it's not instantiated, but we'll double check uh, what's wrong. Maybe it's just too big or uh, too small or something. Um, we'll, we're gonna be covering prefabs um, soon. Um, so this is like an intro to the remote asset. And um, again, anytime, please open the script and actually look at the APIs that are used. Uh, so the, the main API we're using is uh, remote reference asset, download asset by passing in um, uh, that passing in a callback. In the callback, we're actually obtaining the actual resource we can do something with, which is play audio, set texture, instantiate prefab, or something else. So um, at this point, I will, um, I think we are ready to actually start building our uh, lens. And um, so, we, so everyone's aligned. I'm going to uh, start it absolutely fresh. Oh yeah, I have been talking to you guys a while. I muted myself. So this is how you know we're alive, live live streams. Um, so what I was saying is that uh, Ola actually has been so kind to offer us to share the project that she'll be creating today. Uh, so once the stream converts to a video, do check out the comment section because it will link you to the project file. I think it's always super useful. You can dig into them and you really should stick around because we actually took a look at what all of us going to prototype today. It's really exciting. I think that uh, it definitely has the potential for you to use it to create a lens that can go viral. So do stick around. Um, thank you so much. So I've started with an empty project. Again, I created my setup uh, with device tracking and back camera preview. Uh, the next thing so I accidentally created this. Um, Script that I need. Uh, the next step I would do is actually import some video textures that I'll be using to show on my TV. And um, I would love you to refer to our uh, guide, which is called uh, Video, uh, mostly because there is certain uh, requirement in order to uh, import video uh, into Lens Studio. There, it has to be. It has to have specific resolution, which is like multiples of sixty. Uh, but it's pretty easy to do by just uh, using some of the online services, like just like resize, compress my video and stuff, or use like Adobe Media Encoder or other tools that are available. Um, some of them are available for free. Uh, so I did uh, do that and I uh, prepared three videos. Um, they're not super cool videos, they're just like little, um, little something like something i saw around me like an orange or a couple books um, and i'm using three of them uh, but and they're pretty short but this use case kind of uh, can be scaled uh, 
for example, you're being less experienced and you want user to open lens every time and see something different or to see something different on each other day, uh, you can upload like 20 different videos or you can upload a video that is uh, longer, so much longer that it takes time to load and uh, basically those are different applications. Uh, so I intentionally did not compress my videos in order to show you how this affects, the, how remote asset actually affect the lens size. Uh, but of course they have to be compressed so much, uh, so much more. So let's just drag in uh, those videos into my resources panel. And today, uh, just because we're gonna be operating a lot of different files, I'm going to uh, try to keep my uh, project resources hierarchy neat. Um, so I'm going to call this folder um, videos and put my original videos over there. So uh, video uh, texture resource as any other texture resource could be uh, added to scene and uh, displayed either on the image component or uh, Let's see where it is. Uh, is there on the image component or uh, any other mesh? So um, the fastest way to add texture to the scene is just by like dragging resource directly into the objects panel. This is a neat trick that was kind of added recently, but we always <laughs> wanted to have it, and um, it just creates like a default uh, setup for uh, this texture. And as as I did that, I see the image component being um, added. And uh, why not seeing this texture is mostly because it's at the same position as um, it's probably the same position as camera is. And also maybe because it's super tiny. So let's just make it bigger. Uh, so now we actually see our um, texture and it plays automatically. And um, the reason it plays automatically because of this autoplay checkbox uh, that is uh, selected by default on all the textures. If you need more specific uh, scenario, you can always uh, disable it. But for simplicity, I'm just gonna keep it. And uh, I will just double check that all my videos are playing and look nice and looks like all of them are good. Uh, so for now, I will uh, disable this object and come back to this later. Um, because uh, so there is like a little limitation to the remote assets at the moment you cannot actually update the resource you've already uploaded you would do that by just uh, deleting it creating a new one and adding the new reference which a little bit uncomfortable to do and uh, we're going to improve that in future uh, in for this reason, I'm going to um, set up my scene almost uh, finally. And at the very end, I'm going to create a prefab of my video texture, of the object that's using my video texture. And then I will go into upload that to remote asset and go into uh, hook that up to be downloaded automatically. So uh, for now, um, let's just start building our lens. Um, again, great source for um, scraping some stuff for your prototypes or even for your, because there are some nice assets even for your lenses. I'm going to go to asset library and I'm going to go to the um, 3D section and grab this retro TV asset. As I click on it, I prefab is added uh, to my resources panel. And I'm also going to, uh, again, keep my hierarchy neat and I'm going to store everything I grabbed from the asset library in this folder. And um, as simple as this uh, object name prompts me, I will just place this in the objects panel. And um, yeah, so we have our TV added, a um, couple little um, modifications in order to make it bigger. Um, again, really uh, neat little detail, the ability to uniform um, object, um, to uniformly scale the object, um, which is good. And I will also add the ability to, um, or I guess that's, that's good for now. Um, so let's see what this 3D object um, 
consists of. And uh, maybe I'll make a little pause and see if there are any questions. So, so far, there are not a lot of questions, but we have so many new viewers. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, actually, I want just to say really quickly, do stick around. Ola is going to be sharing so many, you know, tips and tricks and hacks. Uh, as she already said, there are certain limitations right now in terms of the asset types that are supported for remote assets, but she's going to show you some workarounds so you can take your, your lens to the next level. So uh, no questions at the moment, Ola, but uh, so far, everybody's really excited to see what you make. Um, awesome. Um, so I'm just um, scrolling through the objects and uh, trying to see where is actually the screen through the object. And I can double click on each of them and um, see the mesh selected. So I'm, I'm mostly interested in this um, screen fit uh, 3D object. And um, in order to display something on TV, I will be uh, modifying, I will swapping the uh, texture on this material, the screen fit material. It actually prompts you, it says swap texture. So I'm going to uh, right click. Uh, so I selected the screen fit uh, 3D object mesh, and I will uh, right click on the first material and click highlight. And I'm going to um, see the material properties in the inspector panel. Uh, so right now we have this uh, texture set over here, uh, this like colorful grid of characters, which actually represent my team members, uh, at least some of them, <laughs> and I, I, I like to think so. Um, and uh, let's actually, instead of just, uh, so we can, uh, the easiest way to set video over here is to just swap this texture, uh, but let's go a different way and actually allow to create a um, little screen layout. And instead of using this uh, the, uh, the texture directly, we would, uh, just use a different camera's render to display this on our TV. And, and this is kind of like a neat trick. And uh, this is something I do use like every so often in order to create like a richer experiences. Um, so let's uh, undo what I just did and um, do a couple more tricks. Again, a, a little bit divergent from the remote assets, but it's all going to come up together uh, at the end. So. What I'm going to do, I'm going to click on the plus button on the objects panel and create new um, either screen transform, screen image, or screen text uh, because uh, any of those screen objects uh, also creates a orthographic camera setup for me, like a preset um, object setup that allows me to align my objects on the screen. Um, by default, uh, and how we're used to it, um, the orthographic camera renders its content on the top of the previous camera we had. But we kind of want to change the order a little bit. And in order to do so, I'm going to create a separate render target for, um, for this specific camera. So I clicked on the plus button on resources panel, created render target number two. I will um, rename it to the TV fit just uh, for, uh, for me to make it easier to find it in the resources. And um, the next thing I will do, I will make my camera render it con its content to this specific render target by just swapping it. The next thing I will do is um, make this camera not be, uh, not take its properties, its aspect ratio, from the physical camera of your device, device by just overriding it. Um, and I will switch the device property of the camera to none. And uh, I will also add approximate aspect of the video I'd like to render. Um, so I'd say like, and we can tweak that later, like 0 0.5, basically this is the um, like whites divided by height. Uh, so the bytes is bigger, so let's take it 1.5. And also I can uh, change the screen resolution uh, to something like 16 pixel wide and uh, for a 600 pixel slide and 400 pixel um, in height. So, um, with, so we do not see any difference right now, but we are going to see that so much. Uh, we're going to see that really soon. Um, let's uh, actually make 
our orthographic camera draws something, for example, the screen image, um, which is not much fun. Let's actually make it render our video. Um, since this um, camera is not gonna, this camera aspect is not gonna change whatever device we're using it uh, on, mostly because we overrode all the uh, all the settings. I can uh, be pretty. I can just change whatever I want, and it will be aligned nicely. So I'm just gonna kind of like fill all the area with my video. I can also set it to stretch, and uh, for example, set it up like this, and um, or I can also make it a child of this screen transform, and. Um, Actually, instead of modifying one video, I'm just going to be modifying uh, their parent, which will simplify my life later. And as uh, so one last thing in order to actually plug this TV camera feed is uh, to swap the texture on the material uh, we've seen before. So I'm just going to click on the feed, replace me uh, field, and going to swap it with this texture field. And right now we Whatever renders to orthographic camera is displayed in our uh, in our texture, in our material on our TV. Um, let's see uh, what other cool stuff we can do with it. Um, for example, we could add some screen text and add some subtitles. Um, it's really tiny. We could do it huge and just I don't know, and make a caption just like this. Oh, it's a bit, but yeah. Just something to um, to show you how to set everything up. So um, I think our setup is mostly ready. Uh, we can actually start uh, creating the remote assets uh, out of our regular um, uh, texture video texture assets. Uh, well, so uh, before you get into it, we actually have a guest on stream. I am not sure how to pronounce the name properly, so I'm not going to butcher it. I apologize. But the question is, uh, they are a Linux user and they're wondering if it's possible to use Lens Studio through Windows VM on a Linux device. Do you happen to know the answer to that? Um, I think it should be possible. And uh, you can always ask this question on our uh, forum and uh, we'll make sure that our engineers get back to you. I haven't tried it myself, uh, but I'm pretty much sure that should work. Great. Thank you so much. And I'll also look for the right forum to drop in description while you're setting up the assets. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so in order to create prefabs uh, out of all of my images that use video texture, I'm going to add them to the scene first. Um, so I'm going to duplicate this. Um, yeah, let, let, let's actually save this project. That's a good idea. <laughs> mm. It takes a second. <laughs> I hope this because I'm just running on my computer. All right, that's we always say that that's how you know we're actually doing this live and it's not being recorded. <laughs> yeah, so let's actually duplicate this um, texture three times, and um, for each one we are going to use a different video texture. For now, we're using the local resource. Uh, videos, video two. So we have um, three of them placed here. And uh, let's see how big is our lens right now. So current lens size, like whenever we use these videos directly, we're bundling them into the lens. The, the um, current lens size is 13 megabytes, which is uh, a lot. So every time users like user open the lens for the first time and all this uh, data has to be downloaded instantly when the lens is started. But uh, let's take a look, uh, let's do some changes and uh, revisit this window in a second. Um, so let's uh, right click on, or not, not right click, but let's create uh, prefabs out of those uh, textures. Let's make a new folder. And um, Making object prefab is as simple as just dragging the uh, objects from the objects panel to the resources panel. 
and I just did that uh, three times and I've got three of those prefabs. So again, to highlight uh, video, the asset uh, type of video texture is not supported and cannot be uploaded directly to the remote asset storage. So if you right click here, we just don't have that um, menu item even in the context menu, but we are using workaround. We're bundling that into the prefab in order to upload that to remote storage. And my prefab is actually the screen texture with a uh, with screen image with a texture on it. So that is done. And um, finally, I'm going to my remote assets panel. I am um, just to make it um, a little bit cleaner, I'm going to delete all this stuff I had here previously, and I'm going to upload multiple assets uh, at once um, by clicking the upload asset button and uh, selecting my assets with a shift button and press OK. So it takes some time to do that, um, again, because I didn't compress my videos and they are um, unnecessarily large, uh, but this is just for educational purposes. I can close this panel and whenever everything's done, um, the remote asset references should uh, appear in my resources panel. One, two, and I think we're just waiting for the last one. So Ola, if our viewers are watching, if they compress their videos to begin with as they're uploading it to remote assets, then they can even take it even further and have even more contents be cycled through the lens as they're mm -hmm. using uh, Lens Cloud, right? Yes, for sure. So longer videos, a uh, larger amount of videos or totally different assets, it could be whatever. You can go wild. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I do uh, have um, references to my remote assets uh, imported to my resources panel. Uh, they are they actually have the same names, but they have this little cloud um, cloud icon to them. And uh, whenever you select actually this resource, it allows you to see uh, the original resource name and the organization it belongs to. And um, somehow if you have several Snapchat accounts for, I don't know, for your business and for your personal lenses, sometimes it just gets messed up, but it always like this uh, inspector panel always allows you to flush up like what resource does that belong to. Um, Awesome. Um, so let's. Uh, uh, so at this point, we do have everything set up. We do have our remote assets ready, and the next step would be to actually uh, grab them to to script the um, behavior that would grab our assets from the remote asset storage by demand. And um, we do provide a uh, code snippet uh, on the remote assets overview page. Um, so if we just go to downloading and using remote assets um, section of this page, it actually has a, like a super simple script, which is more common than actual script. So this is like a couple liners. Uh, but basically, we're, we're using the remote asset reference. We are calling download asset function and passing in uh, two callback functions in case something, uh, everything is good and we obtain the asset or in case something went wrong, I don't know, user has bad connection or something, or you accidentally deleted the asset that is used in your, that is used in your lenses. This is actually something to be um, mindful of. Um, yes, and then um, there is a success callback and on file callback. So I'm not going to write scripts uh, right now, uh, instead, I'm going to go to Asset Library again, and um, in Tools section, I will grab the Remote Asset Cycler. Um, so this is like a little template, which kind of covers like the most common use cases, like something you would like to do, uh, such features as, um, let's actually see, uh, this asset again has a readme to it. And, um, a lot of information, but uh, the most interesting is this API part. So basically, this helper script allows us to get asset by index. For example, get first, get second, get that third one. Uh, it allows us to get next asset, like whenever um, certain action happens, I can just grab next, next, and next asset. I also can get previous, for example, if I'm making a, I don't know, audio player, which can which allows me to switch back and forward between my audio tracks, I can do previous, 
and also get get random just to make your experience a surprise. So um, let's actually uh, add this um, prefab to my asset library folder. And I will also, uh, as I did with all the previous um, helpers, I will add it to um, my uh, to my objects panel. Um, let's see what we have over here. Um, well, we actually have a question from one of our from one of our viewers, and the question is: After uploading the assets to the cloud, does the video quality decrease? Uh, no, the video is not being changed or edited in any way. So resource you are downloaded you are uploading to remote assets and the one you're uh, actually downloading to your lens is exact same resource awesome thank you for confirming um awesome so uh we do have readme script we do have remote asset cycler script um which allows us to actually specify the list of the remote asset reference then on which we can uh, uh, later um perform all those operations I've um, mentioned earlier. So um, at this point of time, let's uh, circle back a little and uh, kind of like walk briefly across the best practices. Uh, so we mentioned that uh, remote assets are not uh, downloaded to your lens when the lens is starting. So it means um, you would oftentimes need some um, some graphics, like a placeholder graphic, in order to show a user that this is a place where something will be loaded, or if there is, if the file is picked, for example, to display some kind of like graphic that would uh, show that something is happening, to basically keep a person engaged and to make it understandable that something is going to happen. And um, if you have uh, multiple assets, and this is actually something that this script is featuring you probably won't be uh, wanting to download all assets at the same time, for example, 20 videos and just call download function on all of them at the same time, but rather uh, distribute that in time and only download on demand. And the good um, thing about that is that resources are getting cached and whenever the resource was downloaded once, and even if you destroy the object, it's um, the object that is using it, still the next time you call download of this asset will uh, be so much quicker and uh, it also applies to the asset same assets across different lenses um, yeah so um, let's go on and uh, plug in our remote asset reference into the corresponding um, fields of this array uh, this is just coincidence that this array has three elements. You can add as many elements as you want by just clicking the Add Value button and uh, just delete whatever you don't need. Um, this, and again, um, as we mentioned, something might go wrong. And just in case, in order to prevent us from having like an empty texture or this like a pink checkered placeholder, uh, I would also provide a file, file back asset. And um, I'm going to set it up a little bit later because I need to actually make this in the same way of the same type as my prefabs, object prefabs are. Um, so we do have this. And um, so the first section is filled out. Uh, the next section is an action to do when um, the object, the remote asset is downloaded. So since um, our object is a prefab, the object prefab, I'm going to instantiate this prefab. So I'm selecting this uh, menu item, and this allows me to select the, the object's parent, the container I'd like to uh, place it to. And uh, for this uh, purpose, I'm going to use this um, empty screen transform I've used as a parent of my original videos. So I select that, and uh, because I have the preload first checkbox um, plugged in over here, I actually already have my remote asset video um, downloaded for me and displayed. So this is uh, everything we uh, everything we need for now. Um, let's uh, also take a look at this uh, again, very like exam example of the interaction that uh, could be applied. This is a behavior trigger that um, 
using touch event to call the object, the function on the script. And the function is actually the get random function, uh, the one we've seen before, we've seen in the script before. So every time I tap on the screen, the random asset out of the array is being pulled. So I tap, and you and you the random video is being pulled. And I also think the script double checks that the previous, um, so the random number does not match the previous number, like the little proportion. Um, so this is uh, this works for now, um, but uh, if you like look. Um, carefully, you can actually see there is a moment of time uh, after I clicked and the video have not been uploaded yet, uh, which kind of allows me to see through the screen. And let's let's take care of that. Let's make sure in case there is uh, so there is like something that is shown um, when no video is displayed or no asset is uploaded. Uh, so in order to see to see that, um, I will. Um, actually deselect preload first checkbox and uh, so I can actually see what's behind. And let's really quick do a really simple and cute material uh, which is going to show us this like a noise, um, like a no feed uh, uh, visual. And to do that, I will create a probably empty uh, material. Double click on empty material. This is like a little, little again, the version uh, to material editor and how powerful it is. And I'm going to press tab and create a noise, random noise node. I'm going to um, drag this connection out of the seed property and uh, create UV um, surface UV coordinate. And I'm going to uh, create a input parameter for um, for the noise uh, scale, so I just created um, like a vector two, and this is going to be my size. And uh, as simple as it, we can plug into the output, and we can create another uh, screen image. Uh, place it behind our videos can I try it? this is weird yeah let's just select and uh just apply this empty material over here so right now it is kind of blank i'm going to set it to stretch uh it's kind of blank but uh it is just because the graph um size at the size input is set to one and let's just set it to the same number as our um, lecture sizes and now we see this um, nice pattern can make it bigger smaller let's just keep like that for now and in order like to make it more realistic um, we can add a scroll scroll coordinates now and just in, inject it over here by uh, pressing the shift button. This allow us to kind of like put uh, the node into the uh, existing connection. And uh, yay, now we have this animated noise um, image. Ola, you're showing all kinds of magic on today's stream, but for somebody like myself, who is definitely scared of the material editor, could our viewers do something like, uh, for instance, find a, a giphy of a like a fuzzy noise and whatnot in case? I mean, I'm not saying you should not try. Ola showed you yeah. how, so you should. But if you're, you know, if you're too scared of it like myself, could they, for instance, add a giphy of a fuzzy material, uh, like a fuzzy screen, and um, just uh, do that shortcut? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so the giphy button is. Um... I know it was in a different place, but right now it's available over here in the corner of the Add New uh, menu in the Resources panel. You can always click it and um, search for whatever you'd like. Um, so we can, again, find the noise texture or we can um, go and find some kind of loading indicator. And we can also add this um, as a resource. And we can also plug it in 
as a different kind of, um, or even like overlaid on the top. Let's um, reset this image. So it has texture input and plug it in over here. And again, because we um, placed everything into the orthographic camera as like a middle step, it allows us to create a nice uh, screen arrangement and put this like whenever we like it. Um, uh, awesome. So there you have it. You now know how to make something super custom or how <laughs> to rely on a library of materials that are already available. Ole is showing you all kinds of magic today. Mm -hmm. So we do, uh, as you might have noticed, our lens size is like insanely big right now. This is because uh, we use 20 megabytes of our uh, local resources and exact same 20 megabytes of remote SSS. So let's go and uh, remove those actual uh, video textures from here because we already uploaded them and we do not need them anymore. And um, then save our project. Just in case. And next thing I would do is uh, refresh the lens size panel and see how how big is the lens now. So it's not red anymore. And if uh, we click over here, the current lens size is still um, six megabytes. And I think I do know why, because I still have this uh, this texture sneaky over here. I'm going to delete it too. And I'm going to update this. And um, yay, my lens is now like 0, 0.69. 0.69 megabytes instead of like all 20 megabytes we had at the beginning. That's incredible. Um, yeah. I mean, just think about how many more devices can uh, load that uh, lens now without, you know, without like blowing up their phone. <laughs> yep. Uh, again, you can um, switch. Uh, so right now we have like super simple tap interaction. Like whenever we tap on the TV, the new video is. Uh, it's popping up. Not popping up. The random video is popping up. And we can change it to get next to make sure everything goes like one by one every time. And, tap. and we can also uh, go back and preload first. Uh, so preloading first actually makes the asset, if this is something we Kind of advice not to do, but you can actually do that because as it can be small and you're still going to need it, and it just really depends on your experience. Um, so at this point, um, I think the only like cute thing we could do is actually add more of like realism to this uh, TV screen, and um, we do have a lot of cool presets of the post effect presets on uh, added by default to Lens Studio. If we go over here and search post effect and select um, analog TV, either uh, or analog TV or VHS uh, post effect, it would add like an extra um, realism, not realism, like extra uh, kind of. I think it just ties the aesthetics of the TV yeah, together. Yeah, just like everything know, together. Post yeah. Now, Ola, I've been thinking about it the whole time when you've been making this little prototype of a lens, but, um, you know, there's just so many randomizer lenses that go viral. And I actually have made my own randomizer lens about a month ago or so. And oh, wow. I ran into the exact same issue, right, where I wanted to have so many more options, but I didn't end up using remote assets. And so I was limited by the lens size. So I am now just thinking about the next randomizer lens I'm going to make that's going to have so many more options. And I may even use the trick that you showed how to actually put video uh, and it'll still be super performant on any devices. So nice. I know that this goes a lot further than where my imagination is going now. But the first thing I'm going to do after this stream is I'm going to make a randomizer lens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, again, there are still some techniques that you could try making those lenses like optimize, oh, optimize, make texture smaller. But there are specific use cases that cannot be handled that way. And remote assets is like a powerful tool. It's a bit complicated to set up, but once you set it up, once you know how to do that, and it just like adds an extra tool in your tool belt, 
uh, next time when you will you will face some like optimization problem. Definitely. And for anybody who is working on you know sponsored lenses, right? Uh, if you're working with assets that are just you know that are really rich, you know this is a great way to uh, make a great uh, rich performance uh, sponsored lens. Mm -hmm. Uh, from now on, we can develop this lens further. We can stop here. Uh, the project I will provide will have like a little remote to it, and you can press three buttons in order to um, uh, to show three videos, uh, which is kind of fun. And um, some other things is just to kind of like polish this lens and make it uh, just to kind of make it planted into the world. Uh, for example, uh, we can do by um, enabling shadows. Uh, which kind of like puts it on the floor or um, other little things like allow to uh, actually manipulate this object. And in order to do that, I will add an interaction component and manipulate component that uh, would allow me to actually drag. I think I need a couple more um, inputs over here. So whenever I drag on the base of my TV, I can actually kind of move it around and place it anywhere. And um, another uh, thing that may be kind of like an important part, um, in the Lens Studio Asset Library, we do have, um, we have added a lot of like graphical hints that allows you to prompt user what to do. And this is something you could add again if your interaction is tapped, just go there and grab a, um, a hint tab so the user knows what to do uh, when he just sees that um, kind of like loading screen. That's really neat. I actually did not even know that we have all those hints. I am just so much know. today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it from me and I'm open for your questions if there are any. Well, let me have a look at our chat. I don't think we have any uh, questions that were specific about, you know, creating organizations or uploading or fetching the assets uh, on, you know, on demand. So, so far, there are no specific questions. Um, you know, maybe we'll give our viewers a few minutes. And I don't know, would you be open to telling us in that time uh, how you got into AR uh, and, you know, uh, what background you've had before you joined SNAP, I think that it would be curious to hear. And it also gives us a few more minutes to uh, see if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm coming from the games background. Uh, I used to be a Unity developer. And okay. uh, a lot of things um, I used to do in my little indie studio is to make uh, educational children applications. And um, there is like something. So there were... Um, the tasks were kind of like on the edge of different uh, softwares and different tools, uh, 3D modeling, animations, bringing that into Unity, plugging in some interactions, making those interactions like um, good for children, apparently because children click something accidentally or they uh, they have tiny fingers and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, like learning all that kind of like provided me with almost everything needed in order to be an interactive engineer. And Lens Studio is, um, adopts everything best out of all the existing, um, other existing softwares. Uh, for example, if you do understand like materials, textures, craft editors, uh, Lens Studio is really easy to adopt. Uh, but also when I worked as a, uh, I'm amazed like how much more um, augmented reality uh, tools that the Lens Studio allow you to use in really easy way. So for example, um, earlier in the day, uh, we wanted to do a children education app of like that would teach you how to sort uh, trash, how to sort recycling trash. And I thought, like, I have no idea how to do that. How would I like look at something and know what kind of like, how do I classify it? But later, when I was working in Snapchat, we've released a ML component, which allows you to actually animal model on the camera feed and actually understand what's over there and now i know that i can actually build that utility i can build that application as a lens and utilizing all those different features as remote assets that would allow me to plug in a lot of different graphics um all the like ui um elements that are available allow me to 
even do like end to end. And I really love like lenses as you do this application. I think it's a really, really nice area to explore. Well, first of all, I think there are many adults that would even appreciate the lens that would allow them to scan whatever they need to yeah. recycle and figure out because <laughs> it's just so different everywhere you live, right? What an incredible way of using AR technology to improve the lives, the everyday lives of, uh, you know, of people that can be using it. And thank you so much for sharing about your experience. Uh, I had no idea that you were a Unity developer. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm looking at the chat and it does not look like we have uh, any questions for you at the moment, but uh, we just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody who popped in today and uh, stayed with us. Again, if you're participating in the Lensathon and you've already made a lens, um, you know, we are rooting for you. Hopefully you will, uh, you know, you'll be recognized for your work. And if you haven't finished your lens, best of luck. You have 19 days. So, you know, make sure that you get it submitted. Um, and we have another stream coming up. Do check our YouTube channel out. The schedule is already out. And we also talk about all of these streams on SnapVR's official Twitter channel. Thank you so much for joining Ola and myself. It's been a pleasure to have you today. Good luck in the Lensathon. And we hope to see you again on the next stream. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.